Hello and welcome back once again to Horsch Live, directly from the Sitzenhof, the Horsch headquarters in Germany. For those of you who haven't joined us uh, today yet, I'm Johannes and I'll be your host for the next session. A quick reminder on what is Horsch Live. Um, obviously, we would have loved to have you here today in person um, for a vivid and interesting discussion on the latest topics on farming. But unfortunately, as we all know, COVID-19 does not allow to meet these days. And so we came up with this creative solution of interacting with you anyways, Horsch Live. Horsch Live, as a pro for this format, gives us the chance to present you an even larger and more international seminar than ever before. And in this context, it's a pleasure to specifically welcome the international non-German speaking audience tonight. Thanks for joining. Before uh, introducing our next guest, I want to quickly uh, remind you on what is very important tonight, as this is Horsch Live. We hope that you are not only hearing from us, but that we are also hearing from you. And that means, please feel free to ask all your questions. Just write them in the chat feature of your channel, and we'll try to answer as many of those, either live following the presentation or via the chat function directly. To our next guest. This is going to be the second session on a topic that is called biocontrol or biological plant protection. It's a topic that we as Horsch have been dealing with intensively for two years by now and um, already the prior session gave us insights on this from the user's perspective. The second session now will allow us to gain insights from the producer's perspective as Gustavo Hermann will present us um, and share with us information about the production and um, the, 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 way, the, the world of a producer of biological agents. Gustavo is commercial director at, Horsch, at, sorry, at Coppert Brazil. Coppert Biological Systems is a Dutch company with a global presence that produces solutions for biological control and natural pollination. In the next 30 minutes, Gustavo will share insights into this innovative technology from the perspective, like I said, of a producer of biological agents. He will touch and address integrated pest management in Brazil on soy and sugarcane, as well as sustainable trends in large-scale farming and biological control as a management tool. Welcome, Gustavo. Hello, everyone. I'm Gustavo Herbert, Commercial Director for Corporate Brazil, and I'm glad to be here to talk to you a little bit about uh, sustainable agriculture uh, in Brazil and the contribution of biocontrol, which is our business. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, corporate background, uh, what we do and how we work here in Brazil, and also the experiences we have in row crops and important crops, uh, mostly outdoor crops in Brazil, using biocontrol as a sustainable tool. I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Thank you, the guys from uh, Horsch uh, in Brazil. And I hope that you enjoy and we are at your disposal for uh, any questions or, or remarks in our presentation. So in the slide two, you can see the front of uh, our head office in Piracicaba, in the uh, countryside of uh, Sao Paulo state. So we put uh, uh, in the sign our core values that uh, are we partner with nature, we work for, for growers, we keep improving, we build global networks and we are family. As you know, Coopert is a Dutch company, is uh, for 54 years in the market and is the world uh, leader in biocontrol and uh, natural pollination. Here in Brazil, we are working uh, since uh, 2012, so we are present in the market for eight years only, but already with uh, the same position of uh, leaders in this uh, growing sector, which is uh, biocontrol. So in slide three, you can see our microbiological unit. So we work with uh, fungi-based products, also bacteria-based products, uh, virus-based products, so here uh, we do most of the products that we sell in the Brazilian market. This is a picture you see in the slide three, is a picture of uh, our factory here. 
and uh, the biggest production is uh, uh, fungi based products. So we produce uh, trichoderma, uh, metahesium, boveria, isaria, uh, five or six different species of fungi that are base of our microbiological products. In this slide four, you can see in a city nearby Piracicaba, the city name is uh, Charqueada, we have the macro uh, production unit. Basically, we produce insects and mites. So these insects are uh, parasitoids that uh, attack pests, important pests, and uh, the mites are, uh, in most cases, predators. So we use uh, microbials and we use macroorganisms uh, as products, as biocontrol products, to integrate uh, the IPM systems uh, that the growers are using nowadays. So you can see in slide 5 that uh, our distribution map in Brazil is uh, all over the uh, agriculture area. So when you look to the map, there is a known uh, presence in the Amazon area. This means that the Amazon area doesn't have that much agriculture. So the agriculture is from uh, the center west down in, in Brazil and this is where we are also present. In the northeast you see also less agriculture because of the dry climate and the, the, the coast region that these are uh, places not so good to plant uh, outdoor crops. So in slide 6 you can see our micro portfolio. So we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 products uh, available now in the market, but also a pipeline of more products coming, more innovation in terms of uh, formulations. And basically we integrate these products with the current, uh, with the existing chemical products to control pests and diseases in agriculture. In slide 7 you can see our macro biological portfolio. It is a smaller portfolio than micro, so we have uh, for now four products, but also with uh, a pipeline and uh, we have a strong R&D uh, committed to this uh, pipeline in order to have more tools available for the growers or the growers can uh, count on biologicals to try to solve most of the problems they have in a tropical agriculture. By the way, it is important to mention that uh, our agriculture uh, is uh, basically a non-winter agriculture. So in a tropical uh, geographic area that uh, Brazil is uh, located, we don't have severe winter. So we have uh, what we call the green bridge that favor, favors the life cycle of pests and diseases. So when you look to US, Australia or other uh, countries that uh, work with the same level of technology and agriculture as we do, but they have the winter, is a uh, temperate uh, climate, and they have the winter to break the cycle of the pests and diseases, it is easier to control them. So you use, uh, of course, less chemicals, you use less biologicals, you use less tools to control or to prevent this uh, pests to attack your plant and to uh, compromise uh, your yield. In this slide 8, you can see that we also work aside of uh, the biocontrol portfolio, we also work with inoculants and biosimilants in order to enhance our portfolio, in order to have a more, uh, uh, a bigger approach for, uh, for instance, uh, seed treatment in, in case of soybean, grains uh, in general, corn, cotton, uh, but also when you look to sugarcane that is an important uh, crop for us, you can work also with biosimilants and the biologicals in order to integrate these tools and have a more sustainable environment in the soil and in the aerial part of the plants. So we have uh, bradyrhizobium inoculants, azospirillum inoculants and we also work with uh, Ascophyllum nodosum, that is uh, algae extract, very well known in the market, with uh, high quality and a high uh, performance in terms of uh, uh, improving the soil for uh, the crops. In slide 9, this is very important for us, we launched it uh, last year, Spark Bio is the first 
uh, Biocontrol Technology Center in Brazil. So it is a partnership between Copert FAPESP, that is uh, the local foundation uh, from the government of the uh, state of Sao Paulo <coughs> to uh, help to support uh, R&D and ESAUC, that is uh, the largest uh, agronomy university in Brazil. So these partnerships create uh, 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 three parts uh, center that work basically to, uh, to increase to improve and increase our pipeline and our future portfolio. So we are looking for new organisms, uh, new uh, developments that can bring to the market what the market needs. So you have a lot of uh, uh, pests and diseases that uh, there, are not, there are no biocontrol still available. So we use the academy, we use uh, the proximity here with uh, Ezauki, that the campus of uh, the university is uh, here located in Piracicaba to create this uh, technology center that has already more than 20 lines of uh, research. So this is very important for us and of course we differentiate ourselves in the market by uh, uh, investing a lot in R&D and uh, this generates new technologies and new products for the market. Okay, in slide 10 we start to really go to the field and show you how we work with uh, integrated uh, pest management. So we work with uh, the, the, the existing system that the growers use, but we try to integrate the biologicals, we try to integrate the sustainable tools in order to bring more balance to the environment and to better prevent and better control these pests and disease. So it means that uh, when you see this uh, slide, you see that we position our products, but it's not that uh, they stand alone, will do all the job. So we go to the grower, we see what he's using in terms of chemicals, and we try to position these biologicals, and in order that uh, in the end of the day, the, the, the number of application of chemicals will be less, and the productivity will be higher. So we bring more sustainability, but we also have to show more uh, rent, uh, more uh, profitability in this uh, system. That's the way uh, we position ourselves. So it's not that uh, we sell products, but we sell uh, solutions for the grower to achieve better yield, but also uh, in line or in favor of the environment. Because as you know, uh, when you only use chemical products in a calendar system, you have a lot of side effects in the plant, in the soil, in the human being that is using these uh, chemicals. And uh, of course, the worst scenario for the grower today, there is a resistance of pests and disease. So we had to use uh, so many doses of chemicals in the past that there are a lot of pests and a lot of diseases that they don't, uh, they are not controlled by these chemicals anymore. So there are some pests like uh, uh, the soybean uh, stink bug or the soybean rust or uh, uh, a bug that attacks the roots of uh, sugarcane, a bug that attacks coffee uh, grains, that uh, they are very, the population, remaining population of these pests and diseases, they are very resistant to all the chemicals that the growers are using so far. So this creates a big problem that you spend more with chemicals and you have less performance of control. So then the biological can break this cycle, this vicious cycle, bringing again control to these uh, uh, pests and diseases and also extending the life, uh, the useful life of uh, these uh, new chemicals, more selective chemicals that are entering the market. So okay, the slide 10 shows you how we work. So uh, we also want to uh, connect this with some initiatives that for instance uh, in soybean may be uh, far from the consumer, from the, from the final consumer. So it's not uh, uh, the, the word sustainability is not automatic as when you uh, talk about uh, uh, 
orchid fruit uh, products, like it's from the field to uh, the table of the consumer. But we start to see some initiatives that uh, is that uh, uh, connect the con the consumer market with the producers and create a kind of uh, 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 trace traceability for you to uh, better know what is going on in that field. So I'm buying a soybean, but where is this soybean coming from? It is an area that uh, was a burned uh, forest, or it is an area that uses uh, 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 known, let's say, uh, good uh, uh, practice, agronomic good practice. So you can see this in some initiatives. I show you in slide 11 the RTRS, that is uh, uh, Roundtable uh, Responsible Soy Initiative. Coopert is a part of this initiative. And in slide 12, you can see uh, producers and certified production 2018 and 19. You can see all over the world, and especially in Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Argentina, you have. Uh, uh, a lot of tons of soybean already certified per year and this uh, on slide 13 shows you uh, the certified farms in 2019 from RTRS it means that you have already a lot of growers that uh, they are really concerned about the traceability about the image of their soybean even if it's uh, a commodity but uh, the consumer wants to know more and more where and, and, and what is the practice of uh, what we are doing here. And especially in these days that you see a lot of uh, not so positive news about uh, Brazil. This is uh, a very good initiative to show that uh, yes, there are a lot of most of the growers working uh, towards uh, a sustainable or a more sustainable agriculture to supply and to feed the world. In uh, slide 14 is a uh, soy footprint calculator. There is a very interesting tool created by this uh, RTRS that anyone can join the site or, or, or an app that you can calculate how much of soybean is in your milk how much of soybean is in the chocolate that you eat or in some products that uh, some people uh, even uh, didn't know that uh, soybean is uh, part of the chain uh, for the production. So this creates a, 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 an instant uh, uh, connection between the final consumer and the growers, uh, the soybean growers, which is very in benefit of this sustainability that we aim for. Okay, so changing uh, crops uh, in order to show you that uh, we are active in, in different crops and we try to work with different scenarios and try to work with different hurdles in, in, in terms of uh, uh, complexity, complexity of uh, uh, controlling pests and disease in Brazil. We start to see now in uh, slide 15, sugarcane. So you see that we also have an integrated system for sugarcane in the same, making an analogy with uh, what you've seen for soybean. We have our products positioned in different uh, uh, stages of the cycle of the plant. As you know, sugarcane is a bigger cycle than uh, soybean. Soybean you have 120, 130 days cycle and sugarcane you can have a one year, one and a half year cycle. So it's, uh, let's say, a crop that uh, uh, uses less products or you have less pressure in terms of pest disease but still is uh, uh, an important market and if you think that it's important for ethanol production and also for sugar production it is uh, very well connected to the consumer and at the same that we see in soybean there are some initiatives that tries try to bring more sustainability to the uh, to the system to the sector so i show you in the slide 16 two one is from the government the federal government of brazil that is called renova bio and the other is uh, uh, 
a European uh, certification uh, institution that is Bon Sucre, the global sugarcane platform. So in Hanover Bio, uh, you can see in slide 17, one C bio that they call in the in the legislation is equal to one tons one ton of avoided CO CO2. So they work with uh, with uh, uh, the concept of how many tons you are not uh, emitting to the atmosphere, and this generates cash in return. So how does it work? You can see in 2020 we had 120 million euro in trade between who is uh, buying the sugar or the ethanol and who is producing because in the production you can avoid the CO2 emission so you can get back, you, can, you are paid from the market to do this. And the target for 2030 in Brazil is uh, 90 million tons of avoided CO2. So this shows a very interesting tool of course, it's still in the beginning, so it has a lot to grow, but a very interesting tool to connect the, the consumer market with the production market, but try to make the producers, the sugarcane mills or the sugarcane producers, uh, a benefit for it. So it's not only the benefit for the environment or the benefit to have good practices in the field, but also uh, uh, cash benefit in the end of the day that can uh, uh, improve this concept of uh, sustainable supply and of course incentivate more and more growers to do the same. So in slide uh, 18 you can see that there are already 84 entities certified by Bon Sucro in Brazil and you see also the location of these uh, uh, sugarcane mills or sugarcane growers in the Brazilian territory. So in slide 19, we change again crops. Now we go to citrus. Citrus, as you know, is a very important crop in Brazil. Brazil is uh, the world's uh, largest producer. I think uh, uh, US was uh, more or less the same level, but uh, because of the greening disease, uh, in Florida. We also have this in, in Sao Paulo state in Brazil, that is the biggest state of citrus. Uh, I think US have dropped a lot the production of citrus in the past uh, five years. And they have a lot of change, a lot of challenges to control, especially the greening disease. And we launch in 2019 we launch a bioinsecticide for this insect that uh, is a vector of this greening disease. So this was a partnership with, uh, so in slide 19 you can see again uh, how we integrate our tools, how we position our products in the citrus, different stages. This is orange uh, because in citrus you have two big production, you have uh, lemons and orange and you can see in slide 20 this was this is the the brand of the initiative from Funde Citrus that is uh, the, the the research foundation from the big industry of uh, orange juice and they call uh, they they have this seal that uh, that uh, say that you are empresa amiga do citricultor means the the uh, it's a friend company of the growers the citrus growers. So we get this uh, stamp because we launched this product. So uh, instead of doing a lot of chemical, only chemical applications to control uh, this uh, pest, you can put some biologicals in between, especially in, in moments that you, you want to avoid the chemical application. So imagine that uh, there were some situations where the growers had to spray just before harvesting. So this for sure will take residues on uh, the orange that is going to the industry to make uh, orange juice or is going directly to the table of the consumer. So when you avoid the chemical spray in this uh, uh, harvest period, you can use the biological uh, insecticide, you are favoring 
the whole chain, you are favoring uh, the sustainability and also uh, the final consumer can be uh, safe and this is uh, very, uh, this, we are very glad to participate in this uh, citrus chain. Changing again crops, we go to coffee, also it's a very important uh, crop in Brazil. We are uh, one of the biggest uh, producers of coffee and one of the biggest exporters of coffee. So again, you can see in slide 21 that uh, we have a corporate integrated system for the crop and you have uh, leaf spray and ground spray helping uh, the plant to be more healthy and we try to work preventively and also sometimes in a curative way to control this uh, pests and disease. Again, like in citrus, like in sugarcane, like in soybean, but this is of course more automatically linked to the consumer. In slide 22 you can see that you have some certification that they are growing in Brazil and they are becoming more and more important for the growers in order to show the consumer that this coffee is safe to be consumed. So you have UTZ certification, you have also Rainforest Alliance. These are very well-known brands in the market and they are very uh, present in the coffee sector in Brazil. So UTZ has already 89 certificate holders and 17 key coffee stakeholders in Brazil. So with these uh, experiences, uh, I hope that uh, we've uh, shown you how we try to help uh, agriculture in Brazil, especially big crops, especially row crops that uh, are very challenging in terms of uh, controlling pests and disease. You see that uh, the, also the expenses from the growers in a tropical agriculture is far, uh, are far higher than uh, compared to, to temperate agriculture. The expenses, I mean, in terms of uh, protection. You know that uh, the chemical uh, protection market in Brazil is something around $13 billion per year. So it's a huge market, but also it is a huge area of agriculture. You can say that uh, there are more or less 1.7 billion hectares treated every year. So with these uh, new tools, with these new technologies, of course, also the new chemicals that are being launched, more selective chemicals, less aggressive chemicals, because we still have to work with an integrated system. So we are not here to tell the growers that they have to quit the chemical alternative and go uh, only biological, of course, that you have the organic producers that they cannot use chemicals, then they use only uh, bioproducts. But in the total agriculture, in the big scale agriculture, we can see that uh, it is a reality already to combine biologicals with chemicals in a sustainable way. It means that you can use less chemicals, less dosage, and less number of applications with the same level of control and with more productivity in the end of the day. So everybody wins. The, the growers, they win because they have, let's say, a more sustainable uh, system, production system, not only in terms of environment, but also in terms of profitability. And the consumers, they gain because they can be, uh, let's say, safer. They can be more relaxed to buy products from Brazil whatever it is, it can be a coffee, it can be an orange juice, it can be uh, a chocolate that you eat that uses a soybean from Brazil. So you can rely on these uh, new initiatives and you can uh, be sure that uh, the agri most of the agriculture in Brazil uh, is following uh, good practices, is following traceability and uh, more and more we see that uh, this is uh, uh, a concern not only from the market, not only from the consumers in Brazil, but also from the growers' perspective. So we hope to uh, we hope to have uh, uh, covered all the the, the subject that uh, we were asking to bring, and we are at your disposal for 
any questions or remarks or if you want to, to get to know better how we work here as a, as a company supplying uh, solutions and bioprotection products, we are here at your disposal. So in the last slide, I say thank you and you see a very nice uh, countryside uh, landscape from Brazil uh, with uh, crop and of course the rain that brings water, clear water uh, for us to produce. Thank you very much and see you soon. Yeah, welcome back to our little studio here in uh, at the Sitzenhof in Germany. And uh, now with us live from Brazil is uh, Gustavo. Hello, Gustavo. Hello, Johannes. Hello, everyone who's watching. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, thank you very much for your very interesting and insightful presentation. Coming to the first question, Gustavo, um, that we received uh, something that here in Europe, specifically in Europe, um, somehow comes up immediately when talking about biological um, control are or is the question about efficiency rates compared to chemical agents and chemical control. Can you tell us a little about a little more about this? What, what, what's your personal and your company's experience on efficiency rates of biological control? Okay. Yeah, this is uh, more or less our day by day here, how we talk to growers and, and, and measure this uh, efficiency in the field. So uh, first we try to avoid to compare one chemical, just one product with uh, one biological. So what we do is try to integrate uh, several tools into the system in order that you can have, uh, in the end of the day, less sprays of chemicals uh, with the biologicals integrated other uh, IPM tools mm -hmm. and in the end of the day you have a bigger yield on that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of efficiency, uh, talking about pests and diseases, mm -hmm. it has of course to be at the same level. Mm -hmm. So we call this uh, high performance bio products and uh, not uh, all the companies uh, in our sector have uh, the quality to do so, mm -hmm. but of course, if the growers are not satis satisfied with the efficiency of the biocontrol products, they just quit and go back to chemicals. Sure. So the, the answer for this is that in total, it has to be at least the same uh, level of control uh, of the major pests and diseases in the field. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Would that be at the same level of workload for a farmer? Um, or like you say, I mean, you can't really compare one to one exactly but to say I'm, I'm replacing one chemical with uh, biological agents could one say this is th at the same workload the same input of, 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 of work that, that one needs or do I would I need more sprays more 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 passes or something okay good question Hannes. Uh, there are some uh, let's say low quality products in the market that uh, people used to use a lot of uh, quantity mm -hmm. and this is not uh, ideal mm -hmm. so what we do in terms of industry mm -hmm. is try to have the same level of dosages mm -hmm. in order that we can use the same number of operation mm -hmm. in the field the same spray operations or seed treatment operation and the level of uh, the dosages mm -hmm. of, uh, of uh, the biologicals are pretty similar mm -hmm to chemical. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you compare the operations, mm -hmm. you have some uh, good uh, advantage from the biologicals, but also some advantage from the chemicals. Mm -hmm. For instance, the chemical you can spray all over the day. Mm -hmm. The biologicals you try to spray uh, in the morning or in the afternoon in order to avoid the UV to kill uh, the fungus uh, present in the product, for instance. So you have to be more technical to apply uh, the biologicals, but in the other hand, they are less harmful for you, for the environment. So in this balance, the grower can choose mm -hmm. uh, which is best for his system. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, a question that we just received in that context um, is, how high is the risk of these organisms growing resistant to these products? Or like, so that we see the same effects that we've been seeing with chemicals, with biological products in the future. Um, yeah, what do you think on this? Okay. That's, that's a, a classic one. Uh -huh. uh, every, every grower, uh, when they start to use uh, bioproducts, they, they ask uh, the same. Uh -huh. So uh, basically, uh, when, when we work with, uh, with uh, nature products that uh, 
causes diseases in some uh, pests or can fight some diseases in the soil, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's a requirement that this product is not uh, the, the mode of action. It's not creating, uh, it's not uh, letting resistant population of the pests in the field. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a few words, let's say that uh, the, the mode of action from the past to be resistant to a biological is evolution. Mm -hmm. So you, it, it will take uh, uh, some hundreds or, or thousands of years for an insect to be resistant uh, uh, to a fungi or fungus that we apply and causes disease in this insect. So it's not really very specific mode of action mm -hmm. like the chemicals. Mm -hmm. So in 10 insects that they get in contact with the fungus, mm -hmm. these 10 insects will be with the disease. Mm -hmm. It's not, if you compare with the chemicals that uh, if you spray in 10 insects, maybe you kill eight yeah. and the two yeah. are already resistant yeah. to that uh, molecule. Yeah. So it's, it's really different in terms of, uh, and, and I would say that this is the, the biggest drive for our market uh, here in Brazil, that is uh, uh, pest uh, resistance uh, management. Okay. Well, it sounds uh, quite sustainable to say so. Um, and seems like another pro for biological agents. Um, when we talk of those agents, um, you explained quite well in your presentation the different agents that your company um, is working with or is looking at and producing. Um, when we talk about Macro and micro agents. Um, is there, from your point of view, from your company's point of view, any preference for the future? Is there? Would you say that there will be one prefer better than the other, or more successful than the other in the future? Or is it in that integrated system? Do we need both, anyways? Well, we need both, of course, because uh, with macro you have more tools. There are some. Uh, uh, pests, for instance, that uh, you still don't have any micro available, so you can use macro. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you look to the total market uh, here in Brazil, it's uh, nowadays 80 to 20. So it's 80% of uh, the biocontrol market is uh, micro mm -hmm. and 20% is uh, macro. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, when you think that uh, uh, part of the plant protection market, that it's basically chemical, yeah. products uh, will be replaced by these biologicals. Uh, the trend is that uh, the microbiologicals will be uh, uh, in a large scale mm -hmm. uh, bigger than macro. Okay. And also when you think about uh, a shelf life, for instance, that you can storage one uh, microorganisms uh, for one year mm -hmm. and the insects and mites, you only can storage for uh, just two weeks or one month. It's, uh, it has a big advantage, especially in big countries like Brazil. Mm -hmm. So I would say that this ratio can be 70-30, mm -hmm. but uh, not more than that for the for the macro. Okay. You touched on 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 uh, just on a on a on a further question. Um, that would be, what do you see as a limit to to um, to biological control? Um, to to use biological agents, um, you you just mentioned shelf life um, and the advantage of, of rather um, large size operations. So, is there, in your opinion, when it comes to use of biological agents or biological control as a part of an integrated system, um, is there limits where you say, well, it doesn't really make sense to maybe integrate biological into an existing system, or or is it actually regardless? Is there pros and cons and and also maybe when touching on limits what do you what do you see in terms of regulations i mean this over here in the Un european union regulations is always quite a topic um, is this something that you have to deal with in brazil as well or is it rather unregulated this market okay uh, I, I would not say that there is a limit if mm -hmm. you look to our agriculture is the is the most complex the tropical agriculture is the most complex in terms of uh, fighting pests and disease and and the biocontrol products can fit mm -hmm. but of course that uh, they uh, in the first place uh, the growers say okay but this uh, i have to storage in a in a separate way mm -hmm. i have to apply it in a separate way so it's more about the pros and cons mm -hmm. but 
uh, in the end of the day, we see that uh, every grower that uh, they start to use, they don't stop. Mm -hmm. And this makes the trend uh, and makes us think that this uh, plant protection market will be 30, 40 percent mm -hmm. uh, biological in, in maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the regulation, regarding regulation, I think we have, uh, from the industry association, we have a big evolution in the last uh, five years. Mm -hmm. And I will say that, uh, yeah, it's not uh, already the ideal scenario, but we have a very comfortable scenario to work with uh, in a way that you have a barrier for, let's say, non-quality companies because you have a, a big registration process to fulfill. Mm -hmm. But once you do this, uh, there is a good uh, uh, let's say, uh, certification from the government that this product is a good product for you to use. Mm -hmm. So I would say that we, as an industry, we are very comfortable with the with the current uh, regulation, mm -hmm. even though this regulation is still under the chemical regulation, so you need to improve it uh, year by year. Mm -hmm. But from the grower's perspective, it's not that uh, they have a lack of products because of that. Mm -hmm. Now, the range of products in Brazil, we have more than 300 uh, products, biological products available to the grower. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if it is a small grower or a medium or a big farmer, they have the same availability of biocontrol products. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, just another question that kind of is to the same direction. Um, when you look at the EU market uh, compared to Brazil, um, I mentioned it when I introduced your presentation. Over here, um, we realize biological control is still a niche sector, um, while it is already widely accepted looking at what you're doing in Brazil um, and how it's used there uh, in the integrated systems. What do you, like corporate being a Dutch company, being from the European Union, it, it, it seems somehow weird that, that, that you're successful uh, in Brazil and over here it's still a niche, uh, niche sector. What, what do you think is, is, or how do you see personally as well as from the company's perspective maybe, but how do you see the European market and what do you think will happen here in the future with respect to biological control? That's a, that's a very interesting uh, question, Johannes. Uh, you know that uh, when you compare the, the fruits and vegetable markets, the European market is far uh, uh, use far more mm -hmm. biologicals than we do here. Mm -hmm. So from the consumer perspective mm -hmm. that uh, they are buying a, a tomato or onion or mm -hmm. whatever they buy in the, in the supermarket, mm -hmm. they know that uh, the level of chemicals is uh, less because most of the growers, they use uh, bioproducts. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say that the, it is a paradox because when it comes to row crops, corn or canola or mm -hmm. other crops that you have uh, uh, in Europe, the, the hurdles are, in terms of pests and diseases, are, are far less mm -hmm. than we have here. Okay. So I would say that uh, the, the, the pain, the, the, the day by day uh, struggle from yeah. the growers to continuously fight against big infestations of pests and diseases created a big room for biologicals mm -hmm. because the growers are using the same chemicals or more yeah. or less the same chemicals for more than 20 years. Yeah. And this is the same as we took the same uh, uh, antibiotic yeah. for one year yeah. and you have a bacteria that uh, enters your body and this antibiotic uh, doesn't kill anymore the bacteria. So the resistance issue uh, we mentioned earlier is uh, the biggest hurdle, yeah. is the biggest uh, uh, pain for the tropical agriculture. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'm not uh, an expert in European agriculture, but I think because you have the, the winter that mm -hmm. kills most of the uh, pests and disease cycle, mm -hmm. you, you control yeah. in an easier way yeah. uh, all the problems that you have. So yeah. you, you will use less chemicals, but you can integrate easily the biological. So what we do, what we see, for instance, as a company, corporate is now going from the hearty sector, from the fruits and vegetable sector to the agri sector, that is uh, row crops. In Brazil, we are quite the opposite. We are coming from the agri and going to orgy. Okay. I think both will have, in the end of the day, in the future, a big participation of biocontrol products. Okay. 
So uh, if I summarize from the copper point of view, the pressure isn't high enough yet uh, in agriculture, like in arable farming here in Europe. So climate change needs to increase a little more so that we get more <laughs> resistances and then understood. Very good. Or not. <laughs> However you see it, from which perspective. Um, so we have unfortunately only time for one more question, I guess. Um, maybe coming back to a, or getting to a topic a little bit a little bit that's related and you touched on this but that's not directly um, addressed to the agents as such um, you mentioned the final consumer um, and initiatives like the RTRS um, my question would be when you when you mention when you say final consumer who do you who do you have in mind in that regard who who is that what what kind of person um, where does he live where does that consumer live so who is the producer that buys from Coppet who is he selling his products to very good, very good. Uh, when when you talk about initiatives like RTRS for soybean or bon sucre for, for sugar cane, uh, you think about uh, the European final consumer or the regular person mm -hmm. that uh, consumes a, a chocolate, a milk or, or sugar, and they want to know uh, where it's coming from, mm -hmm. uh, what is uh, the, the traceability mm -hmm. of, uh, of safety mm -hmm. in that food that uh, they are putting in, in, in their mouth. Mm -hmm. But we think that this will be a trend all over the world, mm -hmm. especially after this uh, pandemic that uh, nobody thought it would uh, get this, uh, uh, the problem would be this big. Yeah. And I think tomorrow, it's not only RTRS and Bon Sucre, tomorrow the Chinese, the, the, the North American or the African, I think every consumer will have the right to know uh, the good practice or not from uh, the products he is uh, consuming. So I think now we see it, uh, uh, especially coming from Europe, mm -hmm. European consumers, yeah. big supermarkets, trading companies, but they are thinking about the, the final consumer. Yeah. But tomorrow, and tomorrow it's nearer because of the pandemic, I think every consumer in the world will be uh, asking, is this treated with chemicals? Yeah. Am I eating something that came from uh, uh, deforestation? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Gustavo, thank you very much. That was uh, very interesting. Thanks a lot for sharing um, your perspective, uh, your insights and uh, your thoughts with us uh, tonight. Um, all the best to you. I hope uh, to talk to you soon in the future. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it for us today. To the audience, um, Horse Life will continue at 6.30 Central European time with one of the highlights of Horse Life, which is um, a live panel discussion with Michael Horsch and guests on the topic of uh, trading of uh, bio cereals. Thank you very much for joining this session. Hope to see you soon. Hope to see you again tomorrow. And um, yeah, good night.